back. Welcome to Halloween. Happy Halloween, everybody. A little spooky music. I wonder how many times that song gets played today. It's, you know, if you look at the, the graph of how often Thriller gets played, it probably spikes today, I'm sure. Um, of course, you know, you should play, really play the extended version. Um, does anyone have a costume on today? I see one person. Stand up if you have a costume on. Show off your costumes. Nice. All right. Good work to the costume. I thought about dressing up as a professor today, but I decided not to. Um, so I'm going to continue to wear my 80s skateboarder costume. Um, OK, so today I had originally thought about you know, doing some special spooky material today. But it turns out, the way the schedule has worked out, we don't even need to do that. We've just naturally arrived on the appointed day at some spooky material. So that's going to be fun. So we're going to talk about, start talking about recursion today. That's something a little spooky, if you're not used to it. Something that we will um, enjoy talking about. It's a very cool concept. It's a new problem-solving strategy. It's a new tool that we can use to build algorithms to solve problems. I like that costume up there. It's just sort of fun. I'm just going to sort of stand here and watch as people filter in in their attire. OK. We're going to talk about recursion, though, in the context of a new data structure. So we're moving on from lists. We will, we're done with lists. You'll see them again on next week's quiz. Um, but we're going to start talking today about trees. So this is our first new data structure that we've really introduced in the class. We talked about lists, which were essentially a generalization of an array. A tree, on the other hand, is something very different. In the computer science, it's a widely used data so structure. Um, and we could do a variety of different things with trees. We can actually use trees to store uh, data, ordered data, if we want to. That's not always how they're used. We can store, use trees to store collections of items where we don't care as much about the order. Um, but there are places where trees actually do a good job of representing the data that we actually want to store in them. And that's particularly when this data has a hierarchical structure. We'll point out a couple of cases in a minute where trees are really natural representation of a particular thing in the actual world. Um, so what is a tree? A tree consists in computer science of a series of nodes. Um, each node has a parent and then potentially multiple children. That's the most general definition of a tree. We will talk in this class primarily, our topic will be binary trees, which is a specific subset that we'll see in a minute. Okay, so it's usually easiest to talk about trees. What's going on with this guy today? Um, in terms of, by looking at them. So here's an example. I have a parent node, so we're going to start introducing some terminology that we're going to use throughout our discussion of trees, so this is important to understand. Each node has a, there's a parent node in the tree, or every node in the tree has a parent, and every node in the tree can have zero or more children. So in this case, I have a small tree consisting of four nodes. The node that the, at the top is the parent to the three nodes below it, which are its children. If those nodes had additional children, they would be parents to those children. So in general, a node in the tree can possibly be both a child and a parent. A child to its parent, if it has one, and a parent to nodes below it on the tree, if it has those as well, right? Each child in the tree has only one parent, but parent nodes in a tree can have multiple children, one or more. And again, we'll talk about a lot about a special case of a tree where every parent has up to two children. So there is one node in the tree that does not have a parent. That is the top node, and we refer to that node as the root. Again, this is tree terminology. Um, every other node in the tree, um, if, a, if a node does not have any children, it's a leaf. So nodes at the very bottom of this graph are leaves. Um, so again, we have some special terminology for particular places in the tree. We can talk about a tree in terms of depth. We can enumerate the levels in a tree starting at the root. So a node's depth in the tree is the number of 
references I have to follow to reach it starting at the root node. So the root node by construction is at depth zero. Once I've started with the root, I'm already there. Um, these nodes here are both at depth one. I had to follow one reference to reach them starting at the root. There's a single node here at depth two and a single node at depth three. And so we can talk about, when we talk about trees, we can talk about their depth or their height is the maximum distance that I have to go in a tree starting at the root to reach any node. Okay, stop me if this is confusing or you wanna ask questions as we go along. This terminology is gonna be important because we're gonna start to use these terms on a regular basis when we talk about trees. Okay. So what do we use trees for? What kind of data can we represent using trees? So trees have, as, as you have seen, this hierarchical structure to them. And so trees are a really natural fit for any kind of data that itself has a hierarchical structure. So here's some examples. The Java class hierarchy. You can actually organize all classes in Java into a tree. What's the root node? The one cl Java class that has no parent? Object, yeah. The Java class hierarchy is not a binary tree because every nodes can have multiple children. In fact, all the classes that we've created in this course that don't inherit explicitly from another class inherit from object. And so object in Java has probably millions of children because there's a lot of cases where I have a class and it doesn't have to fit into the hierarchy somehow, it just inherits from object, right? So that may not be the most uh, interesting one. So the files on your computer, are you guys aware that there are files on your computer? How many people knew that? Yeah, that's like not maybe something that you guys are that, so, you know, again, when I was a kid and, you know, everything was great and none of you were alive, um, you know, your, your, um, your, your, your computer has files on it. I know this is a revelation to many of you and it's a good thing that you don't know this. Those files are stored in directories. Those directories are organized into a tree. So there is, Typically, on Unix-like systems, there is one root directory. And then every other directory on the system descends from that root. So that root directory has files in it. Those files can have, uh, or other directories. Those directories can have files in them or other directories, et cetera. So if I start from any file on your computer, I can walk upwards to get to the root. And doing that actually produces a canonical name for that file on your computer. We'll look at this in a minute, a little bit more. Internet domain names follow a hierarchical structure as well. Again, you may not have known this, but one of the ways in which we manage names on the internet, the human names that you type into your browser's location bar or that pop up when you search Google, those human names are managed in a hierarchical fashion. We'll talk a little bit about how that works. Okay, so let's look at so any data then has a hierarchical structure, but I also want to point out that trees are much more general than that. Remember, we create data structures so that we can run algorithms on them. So there's many cases where we use a tree to store data that doesn't have a hierarchical structure simply because there are algorithms that operate extremely efficiently on trees that take advantage of their structure. But there are times in which trees are a great fit. So you know, again, here's the Java class hierarchy as a tree. Everything inherits from object. In this little subset, this is not the entire tree, obviously, it wouldn't fit on this screen, but in this case, pet does not extend another class, so it inherits from object. Cat and dog both extend pet, and then old dog extends dog. And when the compiler runs, it uses this tree to determine whether or not you're allowed to cast objects to various references. So I'm allowed to cast an old dog to an object because doing so moves up the tree. That's an upcast. I'm not allowed to take an object in general, or I can, I can try, but it may not work. Not every object can be downcast to an old dog because not every object is an old dog. So again, here's a place where this tree gets used in a real world setting. Jeremy. So, so, the, so the Java class hierarchy conceptually forms a tree, right? Because of two things. 
right? So, there, that, that, so it's a great question. The question is, do these objects exist in a tree, or have I just put them into a tree in order to do something with them? And that's a good question. The, in Java, remember, there's a couple of rules about classes. The first one is, every class has how many parents? One, only one. And if I don't inherit from object, well, who's my parent? Sorry, if I, don't if I don't explicitly extend another class, what class is my parent? Object. So those two rules cause Java classes to naturally create a tree, right? Those, are, those were our rules about how to create trees. Every node has up to one parent, and there's a single root. There are object-oriented programming languages where if you don't extend another class, your class forms like another tree that's disconnected from the rest of the world. Um, Java is not like that, right? In Java, if I don't explicitly extend another class, then my parent is object. And object is the root node, it has no parent. So in this case, conceptually, the objects form a tree, and then internally, the compiler also creates a tree in order to determine relationships between them, right? In order to determine, again, if certain types of operations are safe or not. Great question. All right, another example. Our second one was, what about, you know, oh, sorry, it's our third one. So files on your computer. So once you guys get into courses where you're working from the command line, this will look a little bit more familiar to you. But essentially, and this is a, again, a, a small subset of the full tree of files on my computer, but there's a root node. That root node has multiple directories in it. I'm using a Mac, and so this is the name that, that Mac gives to these directories. Um, there's a directory called users that stores information about the users on the computer. Inside that directory, it has a child called Challen. That's my directory. That's my username on this machine. It also has another directory called shared, which I guess is for stuff that any user can access. I never really use that. Um, and then inside my directory, there's a couple of different subdirectories that hold, that I've created to organize some of the work that I do. And then those subdirectories have subdirectories and et cetera. But eventually, I get to a point where I have a subdirectory that only has files. And so that's essentially a leaf node. It does not have any children. Starting at any file on your computer, so if I took, if I took a file in this directory and walk upwards, I will eventually reach the root. And there's a single path to the root from that file. That path produces what we sometimes refer to as the canonical file name. That's a name for the file um, that I could use anywhere on the system. This will make more sense once you take a couple of later courses, but I just wanted to point this out because it's another place where trees get used. So domain name translation. So this is actually a really interesting one. One of the things that's interesting about it is it's backwards. So unfortunately, I think I feel like Tim Berners-Lee has actually said that he wishes that they had done this differently. But with the domain name, the highest order pieces are actually at the right rather than the left. So you have to read it from right to left. So for example, there are organizations that manage what are called TLDs, top level domain names. Those are .com, .edu, .net. They just opened up a bunch of new ones, actually. So by the way, if you want to set up a personal website, which I would encourage everybody to do, it's a great time to buy a domain name, because I think last year they just authorized, like, 100 new TLDs, top-level domains. So now there's, like, dot .amazon, which I think is owned by Amazon, um, dot .pet, dot .whatever. There's a gazillion of them, right? Go up and go on online and look. Um, each one of those is managed by a different organization. So there's an organization that essentially manages all of the dot .coms, and it's in charge of handing out the next level of names. So at some point in the past, Illinois went to, and, and these domain, uh, top-level domains have different rules about them. So for example, you can't get a .edu address unless you're an academic institution. So there's a certain verification that goes into that. So at some point in the past, University of Illinois went to the .edu registrar and said, hey, we're a university, we'd like .illinois, is that available? And they said, yeah, sure. So now there's an organization on campus that manages that entire space, all of the .edu, .illinois names. They're up to us, so we can hand them out the way we want. Nobody gets in our way. This is how this process is delegated. 
Then the CS department at some point said, hey, we're the CS department. Um, we want cs.illinois, and so they talked to the people on campus, and they got that domain name, uh, or that level of the domain. And then they are the ones that hand out names on top of that. So this is done in this hierarchical fashion in order to enable more efficient management. So when I wanted to set up the website for the course at cs125.cs.illinois.edu, I didn't have to talk to the people up here. I just talked to the people down here, because there's a group in our department that handles all of the domain names that extend .cs. So if you want to get a new course name or you want to set up a research group, as long as it's, you know, in front of .cs, you can just talk to somebody in the department, right, because they manage that part of the namespace. So again, another place where we use a hierarchical structure. And this structure is also used when I resolve these domain names as well. Um, okay, good. So like I said, we're gonna talk about, in this class primarily, although maybe we'll do some generalizations if we have time, a, a form of a tree called a binary tree. So a binary, you know, a tree in general, every node has one parent, each parent can have multiple children. In a binary tree, every node has one parent, the restriction is that parents can only have up to two children. And because I can only have up to two children, and because of how we look at trees, we frequently refer to those children as the right tree and the left tree, because they're on the right and the left side of the diagram. This is something that is nice from a visual perspective. Obviously, once you start talking about trees with three or four or five nodes, that sort of breaks down. So, you know, you can think of those nodes as being one or two or whatever, right? But every node can have up to two children. Just like we did with linked lists, here's an example of a little class that will store a tree node. So every node in the tree stores three things. It stores an object, reference, because I'm gonna use the tree to store data. That's the point. And then it also stores references to the right child and the left child. I can also store a reference to my parent. That's something that I could also do. But at most, the node stores three references. A reference to my parent, a reference to my right child, a reference to my left child. Any of those references can be null. The reference to my parent could be null if I don't have a parent, I'm the root of the tree. The reference to my right and left child could be null if I don't have those children. If, I'm, uh, if I don't have both, I'm a leaf node, but it's also possible that I'm at a point in the tree where I only have one child, right? Okay. And again, you know, our, our, when we talk about the types of things we do with trees, we're not usually interested in their structure. What we're interested in is using them to store information and the kind of algorithms that we can then write on top of them that exploit this structure. Before we introduce kind of our new big idea that we'll see play out in multiple places throughout the rest of the semester, let me point out something about trees that's interesting, which is that every subtree of a tree is a tree. So here's a big tree. It's got Let's see if I can count today. Nine nodes, okay? So the entire tree is a tree, but this subtree is also a tree. So I have a big tree that's rooted at node one, but it's actually composed of its own node, node one, and then two smaller trees, a tree that's rooted at node three, and another subtree that's rooted at node five. Each one of those is a tree, okay? Each one of those trees is composed of smaller trees. So on the left side of this diagram, the tree that's rooted, rooted at node three is actually composed of one tree rooted at node four plus node three, right? The tree that's shown in blue here is itself a tree. It has a root, node four, has two nodes. And I can continue this all the way down. A single node is a tree. It's not a very interesting tree, but it's a tree. It has no children, and it's the root node. So a single node is itself a tree, okay? And I can essentially go through, now I'm gonna look at the right side, you know, node five roots a tree consisting of four nodes. I can decompose it into two smaller trees, the tree, noted at roads, a little bit, the tree rooted at node seven, and a single node, node 10. And then over here, just to finish, I have a single node, node nine. 
So essentially, I can take this big tree, and I have a principled way of breaking it down into smaller pieces. Every piece is like the original. So every, as I tear this tree apart, every piece that I can tear apart, if I do it properly, if I take a tree and I break off the right part and the left part, I've got two other trees. I take those trees, break off the right part and the left part, I have two other trees. Eventually I get to the point where I have a single node, still a tree. So if I do this, again, I have a principled way of starting with this large data structure, and then breaking it down to smaller pieces in a step-by-step -step process until I'm left with a series of single nodes, okay? So this brings us to the point where we can start talking about this idea called recursion. So recursion is a topic, an idea that I want to make sure you don't think is about a particular type of programming construct. Recursion is a much bigger, more powerful idea than that. It's not just about a particular way of writing a computer program. It's about a property that things in the world have. Recursion, it means that something recurs. There's a recurrence. Definition, best definition I could find online is when a thing is defined in terms of itself or of its type. So here's my tree class. I'm defining a tree in terms of the value at that node, but then also in terms of other trees. So I've got two references to other trees. Those trees are themselves defined through a combination of a reference to a single value that I store at that node, but then references to other trees. So again, recursion is an idea that has a place in mathematics. It's an idea that has a place in data structures. It's an idea that has a place in the natural world. It's also an idea that allows us to use a particular style of programming to approach a problem. But that is not what it is. That's not what it's limited to. We're gonna talk about recursive code and how to write a recursive function. You guys are gonna a lot of practice at this. Because partly it's a great fit for these types of problems and these types of data structures that have a recursive feature to them. Where else did we see this? We've seen another recursive data structure in this class already. I mean, you've seen two other data structures, so you have a 50-50 shot of being correct. What was our other recursive one? Yeah, Justin. A linked list. Exactly. The item in my linked list has a reference to another item. So a list is essentially one item followed by another list. That other list is one item followed by another list. So if you go back and think about how we tore that tree apart, we can tear a list apart in the same way. Every sublist of a list is a list. Okay, so let's see how to use this. And so what we're gonna do is, now we're gonna start talking about a new strategy for solving problems. So it implies that it involves applying, identifying a recursion relationship and using that to solve the problem. Until now, what we've done is we've used iterative approaches. So we've repeated a step over and over again. And that's a great way to solve certain problems in computer science. It is not going away. Maybe toward the end of lecture, if we get there, we'll talk about a case, we'll compare two approaches to solving the same problem, one of which uses recursion, the other which uses iteration, and I'm gonna argue that the iterative approach is actually better. There are cases where iterative solutions that involve repeating things and using the type of imperative programming constructs you've already seen are the right way to solve a problem. There are other times when using a recursive approach produces code that is much cleaner and more elegant. So how do we approach, how do we solve a problem recursively? So there's a couple of different steps, okay? So, you know, I, I think I just said this. Essentially, what we do with iteration is we repeat a series of steps over and over again until the problem is solved. With recursion, what we do is we identify a way to take a large problem and break it into smaller problems. Those smaller problems then get themselves broken into smaller problems until we get to a problem that is trivial. This is the beautiful thing about recursion. If I take a big, gnarly problem, I can break it into small problems that I can solve, and then what I also have to be able to do, and this is important, is I have to be able to 
reassemble a solution to the larger problem from the solution to the smaller problem. So let's apply this in practice to a, a practical example that uses a data structure that we just started learning about. So let's say that we wanted to count the number of nodes in this tree. We're actually gonna come back and do this at the end of class. So, you know, one way to do this would be essentially to find a way to visit all of the nodes and then just increment a counter. So if somehow I could visit all the nodes in a loop, and that actually turns out to be tricky to do with a tree, then what I would do is I would just start at node five and I would say, okay, you know, add one, add two, add three, add four, add five, and now I have six, I'm done. So this is the iterative solution to this problem. Go through every node, using a loop or something, add one to a counter, done. Again, in trees, it turns out to be difficult to write that loop that visits every node. This is easy in a list, difficult in a tree. How do we do this recursively? So here are the steps that we're gonna try to follow when we approach a problem recursively. We're gonna try to figure out a way to break a larger problem into two or more smaller problems. And then we're gonna think about how do we combine the solutions from those smaller problems together. The other thing we have to make sure is that we always are going to eventually get to a problem that is so small that we can solve it immediately. This is sometimes referred to as a base case in our recursive algorithms. So I can't just break the solution into smaller problems forever. If I keep doing that, eventually I need to get to a problem that's so small that I'm actually going to solve it. Now, if the problem gets smaller at every step, eventually that's going to happen, right? Because the problem's gonna kind of go away. What, how do I do this with a tree? Let's say I wanna count all the nodes in this tree. So I'm considering at this point the big tree, and who knows? I mean, you can see all the nodes right now, but when you work with trees, a lot of times all you get is the root node. So I have no idea what's down there. It could be millions of nodes. How do I break it into smaller pieces so that I can solve it more easily? What's one way to do that with a tree? Yeah. I could use a chainsaw, I like that. It's Halloween, so I'm going to, apparently I'm gonna murder this tree, right? Yeah, sort of, right? Where am I gonna use my chainsaw? I'm just gonna go with that metaphor. I'm trying to break this problem into smaller pieces. So what are two smaller pieces that someone can identify? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm gonna say, you know what? I don't wanna count the whole tree. I'm just gonna count the subtrees. So I'm gonna break this into smaller problems. I'm gonna solve the smallest subproblem. What is a smaller problem than counting the entire tree? What if I just count the right, my right subtree and my left subtree? Those are clearly smaller. Right? I mean, no matter how many nodes the tree has, at any node in the tree, the part to my right and the part to my left are smaller than the total tree. They have to be. Right? So essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna count the nodes in my left tree, and then I'm gonna count the nodes in my right tree, and then I'm gonna add one for me. So five is gonna say, okay, again, I'm too lazy to count the entire tree. Instead, I'm just gonna say, let's find a way to count the left subtree, let's find a way to count the right subtree, and then I'll add one for myself and I'll be done, right? Okay. So now, I've created a new problem, which is counting the left subtree. How do I do that? So imagine the rest of the tree has just vanished. All I care about now is being able to count this smaller tree. How do I do it? Do the same thing. I wanna make smaller problems out of this, so I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna count my left subtree and my right subtree separately, and then I'll add them together and add one for me. What's nice about this now, at this point in the tree? What's nice about node three? How can we tell the problem is getting smaller? Node three doesn't even have a right child, so there's no right subtree to count. I only have to count my left subtree. Awesome, okay. So clearly I'm making some progress. So now I'm gonna get down to node seven, and now I'm gonna apply the same approach. How do I count the nodes in this tree? This 
is a surprisingly similar answer to the last two. What am I, how am I gonna make the problem smaller? Pretend you don't know anything about node size. Yeah, Jeremy. Well, uh, but let's apply the same strategy. I'm gonna count the nodes in my left subtree, count the nodes in my right subtree, and then add one for me. How many nodes are there in my left subtree? Zero. How many nodes are there in my right subtree? Zero. So now I've reached a problem that is so easy to solve. I'm done. So I've broken the problem into smaller pieces, and then I've broken the problem into even smaller pieces, and now what I find, finally, is a problem that's so small that I gotta solve it. I can't make it any smaller. There's no right or left subtree to count. I'm done. So once the recursive algorithm gets to this point, I've made some progress. I've counted part of the tree. I've counted node seven, okay? Now let's apply the same approach to the other part of the tree. So I'm gonna break, I'm gonna start at 10, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna break this problem into two smaller problems, counting the right subtree and left subtree, and then I know how to combine the results together, and I'll add one for me. So I'm gonna count my left subtree first. Again, I'm done. At this point, I've broken the problem down into smaller and smaller pieces, and eventually I find a piece that is so small that I can't avoid solving. Once I get to a tree that has no children, a node that has no children, a tree with one node, I immediately know how to count that tree. I'm gonna do the same thing with the right tree. Okay? And so now, I've spent, I've solved all the smallest subproblems. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do sort of the second stage of a recursive algorithm, which is combining the results together. Because those two things are both required. First of all, I have to be able to break the problem down into smaller pieces. Second, I have to be able to combine those pieces easily together to produce the final result. So essentially, I know the result of counting the left subtree of node three, because I got to a problem that was so small that I was able to solve it immediately. I also know the results of counting the leaf nodes here. Again, once I get to a leaf node, when I'm counting, I'm finished. So now we're gonna back up and we're gonna get back to node three, and node three is gonna say, okay, well my approach to solving this problem was count my left subtree, which I did, and then count my right subtree, which I didn't need to do because I didn't have one, and the count from my left subtree was one, I'm here, so I add one, and so I'm done. So now I've counted the entire left subtree of node five. So I've solved half the problem. Let's see what happens in the right subtree. So I was at node 10, and node 10 said, okay, I'm gonna solve this problem by counting my right subtree and my left subtree. I did that, I combined the results together, I added myself, so I've counted the right subtree of node five. And now, I'm gonna back up, and now I'm at the top, and node five said, okay, well, this strategy has worked out beautifully. My strategy was to count my right subtree and to count my left subtree, my right subtree, the, the result of counting my right subtree was three, the result of counting my left subtree was two, I add one for myself, and I'm finished. So I've taken this problem, I broke it down into smaller pieces, I solved the smallest piece, which was the leaf node, and then I combine the results together at every step into a result, which is correct. Questions about this? This will take some time to get used to, and we will go over this multiple times, we'll see multiple examples of doing various types of these kind of operations on trees. A question is about this from a conceptual level, because if you don't understand it conceptually, it's gonna be difficult once we actually start writing code to do this. Yeah? Nope, so the question is, is, is it only working for binary trees? I could apply the same strategy to a tree with any number of levels. I just figure out how many children I have, right? Yeah, so, so how would I generalize this for a non-binary tree? I would start at the top at node five, and I would say, okay, I need to count all of my subtrees. Maybe I have one, maybe I have 10. I count them all together, I count them all separately, and I combine the results by just adding them, and then I'm done. So yeah, you can generalize this. Maybe we'll do a dozen more problems. Good question. Yeah, question. Yeah. 
Six is just the result and we're done, right? Six doesn't point to anything, yeah. So one thing I wanna, I wanna point out to you is that the, the same approach to counting, so one of the things we were doing is we're kind of, we are repeating something, but we're repeating it on smaller and smaller subproblems, and this harnesses this recurrence property of a tree that we talked about, which is that any subtree of a tree is a tree. And so essentially I can take my algorithm and I can restart it on any subtree, and it'll return the correct result. And so hopefully what I'm doing here is I'm kind of claiming that there is a single, fairly simple algorithm that I can run on any tree that counts it, and then essentially what I need to figure out how to do is just restart it on my subtrees and combine the results together. So, uh, do I have, okay. I think what I wanted to do at this point is just show you some of the tree code that we're gonna be looking at for the next couple of lectures. So this is our tree class. We're gonna have a lot of fun with this. You guys are gonna have a lot of fun with this on homework problems. Um, there is a, another instance of an inner class here. This is another case where it's appropriate, just like when we did linked lists, we had an item class. With the tree, we have a node class. That node class is private to the tree. It shouldn't be exposed to anything that uses the tree. That node class stores an object, so now I can put any type of Java object into this tree. And then it stores two values, a right child and a left child. This is a binary tree class. It really should be called that rather than tree. One of the things that's um, tricky about bootstrapping this problem for you is that unlike a list where it was fairly easy to add items into it to create a list from an array, with the tree this is a little more complicated. And so I actually want to look at this piece of code together. This is something that we'll normally give to you but this is our first example of some recursive code. Let me scroll up a little bit. Okay. So I have an add function. This is gonna become part of the interface that we start to support when we talk about trees. That add function adds a value to the tree. And this is a common pattern once we start talking about recursive code, which is that um, the public interface that adds a value to the tree is really only a wrapper on a, a private method that uses some piece of the tree's structure. So there's one, just like with a list, I had a single reference to the start of the list. With the tree, my tree class stores a single reference to the root of the tree. That make sense? So in a list, I stored one reference to the beginning of the list, and then once I could find the beginning, I could find all the other nodes in the list by following the references from one item to the next item. Here in a tree, my tree class stores a reference to the node, which is the root of the tree, and then I can find the rest of the nodes in the tree by following the references from one node to another. If I get to null, then that node doesn't have a particular child. So if I get to a a uh, right that's null, it means that node doesn't have a right subtree. If I go to a left that's null, it means that node doesn't have a left subtree. If both are null, what kind of node is it? A leaf. It's all the way at the bottom. Frequently, you know, for the recursive functions that we talk about, leaf nodes are a stopping point, because there's, there's no way to break the problem down any, into smaller pieces at that point. Once I get to the leaf, I'm done. So how does our code to add an item to our tree work? So it takes a value. And then what it does is it just calls this other private function that adds that value to a tree. It takes, and this, this function called add takes a root of a tree. And essentially it does a couple of things. This is a recursive, our first example of a recursive function. So the first thing it does is it says, if current is null, there's, this is a special case, then I'm adding the first node in the tree. And so I set my root to the new value. Otherwise, what I try to do on lines 25 through 29 is I try to add it as either that node's right child or its left child. So I'm at a particular node in the tree. If that node doesn't have a right child, I added this new node as its right child. If it doesn't have a left child, I add this new node as its left child. 
What happens if that node has two children? So the first time I add a node to the tree, I'm gonna hit the special case on line 24. The next time, I'm going to hit line 26. The next time, I'm gonna hit line 28. What about the fourth node that I add to the tree? It can't go at the root, there's already a node there. It can't be the root's right child, because the root already has a right child. It can't be the root's left child, because the root already has a left child. So what do I do? It has to go in the tree somewhere. Where am I gonna put it? So here's an example where I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make the problem smaller. So essentially I said, okay, I can't add it to the current node, but I'm gonna restart my add on line 30 or 32, and I'm choosing randomly here in order to try to make the tree interesting. I'm gonna say either I'm going to add it to the right subtree of that node, or I'm gonna add it to the left subtree of that node. Eventually, no matter how many items this tree has, I'm gonna get to a node that has an open slot. It doesn't have two children. And then I'll be able to add the node. But essentially what I do is I say, if I can't add the item to this big tree, make the problem smaller. Choose one of the smaller subtrees and add the item there. And if that subtree has, you know, two children already at the top, make the problem smaller. Add it to one of the subtrees that's rooted at that node. Okay? This will make more sense as you guys get more comfortable with recursive algorithms. So I have a constructor for this class that takes a, a list of values and essentially goes through and adds them all to the tree. So this constructs a tree from a list of values. And then I've also provided a two-string method for you, for you. And the two-string method is also a recursive implementation. It prints the current node and then it prints the left and right subtree. This is an overview. This is not the last time we'll look at this code together. All right. And so here's where things start to get a little bit spooky. So we've talked about recursion as a property that a problem has, as a property that a data structure has. And now we're gonna talk about a recursive implementation of an algorithm. A recursive implementation contains a function that calls itself or sometimes a chain of functions that call themselves. But usually what we see is a single function calls itself. We have never seen this before in this class. So here's an example. Here's how to com here's one way to compute the factorial of a series of numbers. So the factorial of n is n times n minus one times n minus two all the way to one. So how does this recursive implementation compute factorial? It says if n is one, return one, because the factorial of one is one. Otherwise, I return n times the result of computing the factorial of n minus one. I'm calling myself. So if I compute this for three, what's gonna happen? So I start with three, it says if three is equal to one, it's not true. So it says, okay, the result is three times whatever the factorial of two is. How do I compute the factorial of two? I call the factorial function and I ask it to compute the factorial of two. And it says, is two equal to one? No. Well, two factorial is two times whatever the factorial of one is. And finally, I get to something that we've called the base case. I say, okay, I know how to compute the factorial of one, so I return one. So that third call to factorial returns one. The second call to factorial returns two times one. And the, the first call, where I started, returns three times two times one. This is a different example, but a nice complementary example of breaking the problem down and making it smaller. So in a tree, typically what I do is I make the problem smaller by grabbing one tr tree, subtree, and grabbing the other subtree. In this problem, I'm making the problem smaller by computing it for smaller values. So if I start with 10, I say, okay, I don't know how to compute the factorial of 10, but I know that the factorial of 10 is 10 times whatever the factorial of nine is. And then I say, I don't know how to compute the factorial of nine. I'm a little closer. I know that nine is, factorial of nine is nine times whatever factorial of eight is, and I keep doing that. Every time I'm making the problem smaller by computing a smaller factorial until I get to one. And then I say, okay, I know how to, I know how to do one. Right, everyone knows what the factorial of one is. And I, I build up my solution from there. Yeah, question. 
So if I delete line two and three, so yeah, this is a great question. So what happens if I delete line two and three? Anyone wanna speculate? Yeah. So this will never stop, right? So essentially I'll get to one and I'll say, what's the factorial of one? Well, I don't know, it's one times the factorial of zero. What's the factorial of zero? It's zero times the factorial of negative one. I'll keep doing that until the program crashes. So this is an important component of recursive algorithms and recursive implementations that they have to stop. We call this reaching the base case. Eventually, if I make the problem smaller, I have to get to the point where I've identified a problem that I can actually solve. If I don't do that, I'll recurse forever, all right? So let me point these two, let me just cover these three strategies. If you're feeling lost or bewildered, don't worry. This is a concept that takes some time to wrap your mind around. It took me a long time to really get comfortable with this when I started programming. For some of you, this will come very naturally. I was actually talking with a colleague yesterday, and I said, I think that in my 125 class, there's like half the class that already kind of thinks about problems this way, this way, and then there's the other half of the class that's much more comfortable with loops and doing things multiple times. That's fine. You're both fine, right? Um, for those of you that are a little more comfortable with iteration, that might take a little time to get used to this, we're gonna be talking about this for the rest of this semester. We will be looking at lots of different cases where we can apply recursive algorithms to solve problems. All right, three strategies that will help. You're also gonna get a lot of practice with this on MP5, by the way, which is awesome. Um, you have to stop. The recursive algorithm has to stop somewhere. If I keep making the problem smaller and smaller, but it's actually not getting any smaller, if I never get to the point where I'm at a problem that I can solve, then my recursive algorithm will never terminate and my program will crash. The problems that I'm able to solve are sometimes known as the base case. So the base case for factorial was factorial of one. The base case for a tree is a leaf node, frequently. That's the point where I can't make the problem smaller anymore, I'm in a tree with one node. There's no smaller problem, right? So I have to identify when to stop. I have to make the problem smaller at every step. So this is another thing that's critical. If I don't, if I'm not making the problem smaller, even if I have a base case, I'll never get there, right? So I had the, the, the step in my recursive algorithm that makes the problem smaller has to actually make it small. If I don't do that, I'm not approaching the base case, and again, I will crash. This is sometimes known as the recursive step in the algorithm. The recursive step makes the problem smaller, the base case is the smallest problem that I'm going to solve, and then finally, I need to be able to combine the results together. So when we counted, and we'll come back and we'll do an implementation of count on Friday, the way that I combined the results was that I added the result from my right tree, I added the result from my left tree, and then I added myself. Depending on what the recursive algorithm is, combining the results can be more complicated than that. Being able to use recursive algorithms also relies on the fact that this is possible. In algorithms, sometimes we refer to as a problem that has this property as having optimal structure, meaning that I can tear it apart and I can combine the results easily. There are problems that don't have optimal structure, and in that case, it's difficult or impossible to apply a recursive algorithm to them, because even if I can make the problem smaller, I can't compute the results. Okay, so I'm done. We will pick up there on Friday. I have a couple of announcements. So, I have office hours today as usual, please come by. Um, so I made a small change to the schedule right before Thanksgiving. Originally there was no class on Friday, now there is class on Friday, there's no class on Wednesday. If you've already made travel plans, no problem, go enjoy your break. Um, if you haven't, we'll be here. If you're gonna be away, the lecture will be online as usual. Um, I will see you guys on Friday. If you haven't taken the midterm yet, good luck.